Okay. Now, what are statutory probate fees? <coughs> um, let me move on for that. Are they really horrific? Because a lot of people think that they are. They hear these, you know, that's what their barber told them. And can any other fees be charged by an attorney or an executor? Statutory fees are fees that the California legislature has said these are appropriate fees for an executor to charge and these are appropriate fees for the executor's attorney to charge. Um, those fees are based upon a sliding scale and they're based upon the gross value of the estate subject to probate. So I think this is best understood uh, in the context of an example. Suppose I have a house worth 500000 that belongs to the decedent there's no, or, and there's a mortgage. Let's put a mortgage on it of three hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. um, and let's say the will leaves the property to my two children in equal shares. Mm -hmm. The probate fee, that is the fee that would be paid to the executor under the will, and the fee that would be paid to the executor's counsel, is based not on a net estate of two hundred thousand in my example, but it's based upon the gross estate of five hundred thousand. And on a $500,000 estate, the statute would say that you're entitled to about $12,000 of probate fees, both to the executor and to the executor's counsel. So there's $24,000 out of that $200,000 net that's going to be paid in fees, and that's just the base fee. Mm -hmm. In addition to that base statutory fee, there are also additional fees that a court may allow for services that are out of the ordinary. We call them extraordinary services. And these could include the sale of a home, as an example, uh, the refinance of a home, anything that was necessary in order to facilitate the eventual distribution of the estate. And those are generally awarded based upon an hourly fee schedule for such extraordinary services. Mm -hmm. So are they horrific? It depends upon the context. For some smaller estates, they're probably not too bad. Um, when I say smaller, meaning you know, a hundred thousand, maybe two hundred thousand. But once you own real estate in California, uh, particularly if it's heavily encumbered, it makes a lot more sense to try and avoid probate. Mm -hmm. One, just because the speed with which we can administer the estate, uh, and secondly, to keep the cost down for the family. Okay. Now, what happens if a decedent dies without a will? Oh, that's easy. California will give you one. Okay. It's your free will. Oh California boy. gives every uh, oh boy everyone uh, their free will, and it basically says is this is what we think you would have done with your property had you written a will. Mm -hmm. And so, when you die without a will, that's referred to as intestate. I've died intestate, and under California law. It depends first upon what's the character of the property. Is the character community property, in which case it will pass to a surviving spouse, or is the character separate property, in which case it may pass to the surviving spouse, it may pass um, partly to children. Uh, it depends first upon the character. So if one is married, community property will pass to a spouse, separate property will pass to a spouse and to children in varying percentages depending upon how many children there are. For a decedent who died without a will who was not married, we first look down the line. Did he or she have any children? Did he or she have any grandchildren? Did they have parents who were living? And under California laws of intestate succession, the property would first go to children, then down to grandchildren. And if there was, um, let's suppose there were three children but one had passed away, uh, but survived by two children of his mm -hmm. or her own. Right. So in other words, I've got a couple of grandchildren down there. In that sort of situation, California law develops a whole uh, scheme of mm -hmm. who's going to inherit the property. Okay. Again, what you're doing by not doing a will or a trust is you're leaving it up to California to decide who's going to take your estate. Okay. Not a smart move. So um, next question is, should you keep some cash on hand for incidental items at death. So, Well, Mike, I actually uh, think you ought to take it with you. I, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure what's in the afterlife, but if you take it with you, it, it'll open a few doors. Uh, yeah. in, in all seriousness, there is frequently a need for cash, immediate yeah. cash in a post-death situation. 
Um, this would be for such things as funeral expenses. Yes, they can be put on a credit card. Yes, a child or a family member can advance funds and be reimbursed. Um, but it's typically better and easier and less stressful, particularly in those deaths that are unexpected, to have some cash available to meet those urgent needs. Um, because it oftentimes will take us some time in a probate situation to have an executor appointed. It could take 45, 50 days before we actually have someone appointed by the court. Uh, and what do you do for that period of time? So if we had, for instance, uh, a joint tenancy account with a trusted family member, or if we had um, uh, some other immediate access to funds such as life insurance that could be paid out relatively quickly for a small policy, those are your sources of cash. Otherwise, um, I might have to go into court and have what's called a special administrator appointed because if I have an urgent need for cash and we don't have it and we have to make payroll or we have to uh, meet some expenses of administration that we can't wait the 45 days, then we have to get a special administrator. So I've seen and heard of situations where um, uh, surviving spouses have gone and cleaned out joint bank accounts and other things. Um, do you have any thoughts related to that? Well, it depends where the decedent yeah. wants to leave his or her property. Yeah. Most decedents are going to want to leave it to a surviving spouse in many cases, or at least leave it in trust for the benefit of a surviving spouse. Um, but if you, there's a situation where the decedent is not going to leave it. And I've had these cases. We've all had cases where I will represent one party in the marital relationship and mm -hmm. he or she will come in and say, I want to disinherit my spouse. <laughs> um, and I'll first talk to him about, well, why not get a marital dissolution if, uh -huh. the, if things are yeah. that bad? But assuming that they don't want the entire estate to pass to their spouse, um, then it's incumbent upon me to advise them, we'll make sure then that you terminate joint tenancy accounts, make sure that you terminate joint um, community property accounts, because otherwise, I don't care what your will says, if you have a multiple party account and it has a spouse or somebody else on it, that property in that account will automatically transfer to the survivor upon death, um, and it supersedes what your provisions of the will are. So it's, it's critical that we make certain that whatever your intent is, is going to be accomplished. First, in terms of whatever writing you're going to put together, and then in terms of how we're going to administer the assets. Okay. Like I said, folks, we're not going to have time to get into all the details, so, uh, but these are important issues uh, to be aware of, and so, uh, so look into them. Okay, well, moving on then. What is an executor? What is an administrator? What's the difference? Practically speaking, there is no difference. Um, they're both called personal representatives. An executor is the formal title for someone who is appointed as the person under a will. So I have a will. I designate Mike Gray as my executor. If the court appoints you, you are my executor. I named you in the will. An administrator is where no one is either named in the will or someone different than the person named in the will is appointed. And they are called an administrator, sometimes an administrator with the will annexed. Or if there is no will, they're called an administrator. Um, they're all the same person. They are called a personal representative. They're still the person in charge of gathering up the assets, collecting them, inventorying them, filing the inventory with the court, and ultimately distributing them.